Is there a link between the loss of Arctic sea ice and the strength of El Nino? Hello friends, Jim here. Well, let's take a look at that. Atmospheric scientists link Arctic sea ice loss to strong El Nino events. And we'll go back to this uh, diagram a little later on. El Nino, we all know what that is, right? It's a climate pattern where uh, warm waters in the eastern Pacific uh, drive hotter uh, weather. And this latest El Nino is starting to uh, decline. It's waning. It's moving into the neutral state. But it did bring a load of record heat. It brought a lot of heavy precipitation. And we saw a large increase in sea surface temperature. New study published in Science Advances by researchers at the University of Albany and Nanjing University of Information Science Technology in China has found that these events, which typically occur once every few years, might even become stronger due to melting Arctic sea ice. So to use various uh, modelings and uh, the simulation and in C2 observational data, and what they found was that the current interaction of Arctic sea ice with the atmosphere reduces the strength of El Nino events by up to 17% compared to when no such interaction takes place. The amount of sea ice that survives the Arctic summer has declined 12.2% per decade since the late 1970s, Projections show the region could experience its first ice-free summer by 2040. Well, we're back to that old question of how do you define a blue ocean event? Is it absolutely no sea ice anywhere in the Arctic Ocean? Or is simply a sea ice extent of less than 1 million square kilometers sufficient? If the latter, well, some would say that's already happened. Climate models are already projecting a strengthened El Nino in the upcoming decades due to global warming. Arctic sea ice is also projected to decline rapidly in the upcoming decades. Said uh, Aigio Dai, would they? a distinguished professor at UA Albany's Department of Atmospheric Environmental Science and a co-author on the paper. Our new study suggests that Arctic sea ice Air interactions in the current climate significantly reduce the amplitude of, L, of ENSO compared to the case without such interactions. This represents a new example of the various impacts of Arctic sea ice on our climate. Well, the fact that uh, you know when you have ice, there's increased albedo helps keep things a wee bit cooler. Remove the ice and well, the albedo kind of tanks. So what about the sea ice and El Nino interactions? So the researchers performed, analyzed uh, several global uh, model simulations, letting them run for, you know, 500 years. And what they did was they, uh, in one uh, model run, they fixed atmospheric CO2 levels, uh, actually both of them, but one model, they did the sea ice air interactions in the Arctic and another one without it. And then they looked at the difference between the two simulations. And what they found was that Arctic sea ice air interactions weaken El Nino related variations by about 12 to 17 percent compared to when no such interactions was involved. So what this does is it represents the impact of the Arctic sea ice air coupling that led to significant changes in tropical Pacific Ocean mean climate states, as well as uh, ENSO strength. This is mainly due to asymmetric impacts of positive and negative sea ice anomalies on surface fluxes, the exchange of heat crossing the surface between the ocean 
in the atmosphere. Well, if you have a cover of ice, that's a pretty decent barrier to prevent the heat from going into the atmosphere. Whatever heat is there first needs to melt the ice, at which point there may be insufficient energy to uh, diffuse through the atmosphere of any noteworthiness. But without the ice there, that heat can uh, readily diffuse to the atmosphere, warming the atmosphere. And they were finding that uh, in their study that you had increased uh, air temperatures. So our findings highlight the crucial role of sea ice air interactions in regulating El Nino activity over the tropical Pacific. Now it's important to understand that you have what's called teleconnections. And it may seem like, oh, you've got, for example, the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation. So that's off there in the Atlantic doing its thing. And you got the Arctic dipole and it's doing its thing. And the North Atlantic oscillation doing its thing. And, and so, and the Pacific decadal oscillation. Well, they're all connected. And they're connected via the atmosphere. You know, the various atmospheric cells, for example, the Hadley cells, right? The Fourier cells, right? You, they're all connected. So what happens in the oceans is going to interact with the atmosphere and vice versa. And then all the diffusions and the fluxes and, and so forth and the gradients, they move about and then they impact you know, what happens over in section A will impact something going on in section B, impacting section C, etc. They're all connected. You know, it's been shown that and the strength of ENSO or the, and, and along with what part of the cycle of ENSO impact what happens with the AMO. Well, and it also impacts the PDO. We know the PDO is, is connected to what goes on with the Arctic Dipole, the Arctic Oscillation, and North Atlantic Oscillation. It's all connected. And then when they compare their model results with the actual data from 1921 to 1960, where there were strong sea ice interaction, and then 1971 to 2000 with weak interaction, they were uh, qualitatively consistent with the model results. Now, so this is a very interesting findings. And this is a series of papers that uh, Di and his uh, colleagues have put out. And they examined, for example, in 2019, the cause of the Arctic amplification, which we now, which was a term we use to describe Arctic warming at two, three, four times, some places five times the rest of the planet. He published another study in 2022 that show how fluctuations in Arctic sea ice cover impact Atlantic sea surface temperatures. The main takeaway is that shrinking Arctic sea ice has many far-reaching climate impacts. So, how many times have I said what happens in the Arctic does not stay there? So, let's take a look at this uh, diagram here. And... Uh, Let's see. Oh, I didn't want to do that. Oops. Let's see if I can at least shift this around. I can't. Okay. Well, um, we'll, we'll, we'll do our best here. So it starts up here. So we have this diagram here to the North Pacific, right? Here's the equator. Is California, ba right, California, Baja. Alaska, the Aleutian, Bering Strait, Arctic Ocean, right? Alaska right there, Kamchatka Peninsula. Okay. And what they have here is that with sea ice air interactions induce more shortwave radiation, right? So more shortwave radiation uh, gets through. 
If you have clouds, it bounces off the top. Okay, so whatever does penetrate through is of lesser uh, energy. So by inducing, if it gets through, if it induces more shortwave absorption, it leads to warmer sea surface temperature, indicated right here, as well as temperatures at the surface, you know, in, at the what's also measured at the two meter level. Okay. So therefore, warmer air temperature. So you get some long wave reflection, and it, there may be some re-reflection of the long wave back down. In other words, it gets, some of it gets trapped, right? So this is long wave getting trapped. This is long wave escaping. The MIZ refers to marginal ice zone. So you have the sea ice. So this is basically the transition from sea ice to the ice melting to eventually disappearing. So where you have part of the marginal ice zone and the sea ice because you have the ice cover, the sea surface temperature is going to be cooler. Well, no, this, it's less warmer than where it's exposed. So interactions induce more uh, shortwave absorption. Leads to warmer sea surface temperatures, warmer air temperatures. Some of that long wave energy escapes, some of it is trapped. This can result in equatorward propagating anomalous Rossby wave. Now, Rossby waves are planetary waves. They occur in the atmosphere and in the ocean, as are Kelvin waves. Kelvin waves are also planetary waves that occur in both atmosphere and the ocean. And we see them a lot in the Pacific, especially uh, the North Pacific, which is a nice basin, we see the Rossby and the Kelvin waves quite a bit. They, they propagate what we say basin-wide. And it's been, these two wave types have been well studied, uh, you know, and so forth. So, um, Rossby waves can impact how jet streams move about. That's, that's the implication from when they mentioned that. A, so leading on, so the absorbing more shortwave absorption will change, result in some anomalous Rossby waves affecting the jet stream. This can lead to weakened northeasterly trade winds with resulting warmer sea surface temperature. Okay, that's indicated by these black arrows here. And then that in turn can lead to enhanced cross equatorial trade winds with colder sea surface temperature. The result is you have an increased zonal sea surface temperature gradient. So it's sharper, weakened zonal advective feedback. So in other words, if you have a sharper gradient, you're not going to have as you're going to have reduced advection. The warm water accumulation, negative wind stress curl anomaly with wind Ekman pumping. In other words, you're going to impact upwellings and downwellings. And they're showing basically a, a depression of the warm water. So when we see the cooler conditions in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific, that's of course associated with La Nina events. Remember, they're saying ENSO. So when you have the ENSO, this warm tongue moves up. And then, and then the thermocline or pycnocline is deeper. But then this inhibits uh, nutrient mixing in impacting productivity. And I'll close this so we can, what happens is the thermocline deepens and weakens the thermocline feedback and all these things here. This is again, you know, when you look at the Rossby waves, the trade winds being an impact and so on, it shows you the teleconnections that the whole planet has. 
The atmosphere and oceans are a couple system. Atmosphere, which, what takes place there, impacts the oceans. What takes place in the oceans impacts the atmosphere. And we're now seeing re research that the mesoscale eddies are a major mechanism in facilitating this communication between the atmosphere and the oceans. So the bottom line is more sea ice, weaker El Ninos. Less sea ice, stronger El Ninos. And we're losing the sea ice. El Ninos are going to get stronger. That's the, that is really, in a nutshell, how to describe this, how to best sum this up. Less sea ice, stronger El Ninos. And as I just did in my ocean heat content update, my latest one, when you have a strong El Nino, the heat, the energy, the ocean heat content is going to make for increased sea surface temperature, increased diffusion to the atmosphere, warming the atmosphere. So there's another aspect of all that ocean heat content in the oceans. Less sea ice, right? The ocean heat is disappearing the sea ice. That's making the El Nino stronger. And it's doing the lovely favor of returning all that heat energy stored in the oceans back to the atmosphere. It's going to be interesting for the next, for the upcoming decades. Thank you for your time.